Welcome and thank you very much for joining us on episode 119 of the Blazers Edge podcast presented to you today by BlazersEdge.com. I'm your weekend host, Chris Lucia. And I'm your weekend co-host, Brandon Goldner. If you want to get in touch with the Blazers Edge weekend podcast, you can email us at BlazersEdgePodcast at gmail.com. And please rate, review, and subscribe to us on both iTunes and Stitcher. Woo! How are we doing, Brandon? Pretty good. How are you, Chris? Uh, I'm doing I'm doing pretty well. This so we we're recording this a little you know kind of midweek. Uh, it's going to come out probably later on in the weekend. Um, so we're not going to be covering any of the games on this podcast. And I know Brandon, last time we tried to you know have a have a conversation uh, for this podcast about the Blazers before they played the Warriors. Uh, you remember what happened last time, right? Yeah, I mean, I remember I was predicting a 20-point Blazers win, and you guys all laughed at me, and then they ended up winning by 30. <laughs> so uh, Blazers going undefeated between recording time and when the podcast drops, book it. Exactly. So uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna pretty much avoid you know talking about the Golden State game that's gonna be happening on Friday. By the time you hear this, it's gonna be already in the books. Uh, then there's a back to back on Saturday night. Uh, so we're not really going to be, you know, covering the games from this weekend. Uh, instead, we solicited uh, the Blazers Edge audience on Twitter. Uh, we got a couple of our coworkers at Blazers Edge to submit a few questions. Uh, we got we got some questions from listeners who emailed Dave uh, earlier on in the week. So we got kind of a kind of a grab bag of a mailbag uh, for everyone here, Brennan. So uh, what do you say we just kind of get started with it, man? I think we're going to try to answer. I. How many do we get? Like a, like a dozen or so? I think. Yeah, we got like a dozen questions. We can try to plow through all of them, but the ones that we do get to, thank you all for submitting them. And if we didn't get to yours, then just keep throwing them at us and we'll get to them next week. Absolutely. All right. Well, hit it, Brandon, with the first one. Let's do it. All right. Well, why don't we kick it off from an email that we got from Michael, who emailed our managing editor, Dave Deckard. And Michael, thanks for emailing. So he runs down a list of elite point guards, Reggie Jackson, 30 points, Kyle Lowry, 28 points, Steph Curry, 31 points. And he's framing it as in Lillard's defense. So he goes, see a pattern. Lillard's defense against some of the elite guards is troubling, and he's not always capable of making up for it on the offensive end. And while Lillard is an offensive genius, I'd really like to see him show some improvement on the defensive end, especially when he's playing his peers. And I assume what Michael means by playing his peers are those elite point guards, which Damian Lillard is definitely one of those at this point being in top five of many MVP conversations. So Chris, Damian Lillard's defense obviously been kind of hit and go uh, for his career, been a little bit better as of late. But what do you think? Does Damian Lillard struggle particularly against those elite point guards? Or do you feel like it's all just kind of not really doesn't matter who he's playing? Defense is the same either way. Well, okay, so who in the NBA doesn't struggle against elite point guards? That's a good that's a good point. I mean, they're obviously elite point guards for a reason, it's cuz they're good. Exactly, exactly. I mean, this this list is I'm not going to say Reggie Jackson's elite, um, but you got but he's Jackson. Been co- he's been cooking the Blazers. I mean, just to say, but yeah, you're Exactly. Right. I mean, but but he's a he's a great he's a great point guard in the league. Uh, Kyle Lowry, Isaiah Thomas, he's a you know small guy who likes to score a lot. Uh, you got Curry on the list twice. Conley, solid guard. Uh, Lowry comes up again. Westbrook. Uh, I mean, look at these like every every team in the league has a hard time slowing these guys down. So to say uh, Steph Curry dropped thirty one points and twenty six points on the Blazers, that's you know that's roughly his average. You know, um, so. I would first say that while while I think that sure there's a pattern that elite point guards are blowing up the Blazers, I'll give you that. But I think elite point guards are blowing up a lot of teams right now. Yeah, I mean, I would I would say the same thing. And so just to say, I mean, Damian Lillard seems to get up, especially on offense when he's playing some of those better point guards. I think the point Michael is trying to make, and I, I can definitely see it, is that if Damian Lillard tries to get up offensively on these guards, shouldn't he be trying to get up defensively um but i don't feel like his defensive play is just his fault i feel like part of it's a team system yeah and and you know that on uh on thursday uh dan the orangutan for blazer's edge 
She's uh, never been called that before. <laughs> exactly. Uh, put out a, a pretty solid article. If, if you haven't read that yet, listeners, you should check that out. Um, but it was talking about Damian Lillard's defense, and he kind of took, uh, he got some access to some Synergy Sports stats, which are always uh, awesome. They had, yeah. it had like, every aspect of how he defends so like going over the screen going under the screen it showed the uh the percentage of of times he does that uh during plays and and i mean it was it was absolutely crazy how in depth those those stats go with, with the the synergy sports but i digress um combining that with some video evidence and then and then just kind of taking the eyeball test and and kind of you know based on what what dan was seeing from dame this year and individually it kind of looks like Dame isn't doing half bad. At least, I think his reputation as a poor defender, I think maybe that's going to be in the rearview mirror in the next several months. I imagine as as more people, you know, kind of kind of take this into its proper context. I think. Um, at any rate, you know, looking looking at that article from Dan, um, it, it did show that Dame was performing, you know generally better on the defensive end as an individual and as an individual but one thing that was kind of pointed out and i think a, a number of commenters have also you know kind of brought this up before is that damian lillard doesn't really have rim protection behind him you know to the to the same degree that a number of other teams do um so while he is not the best perimeter defender in the world his stats are going to be or his his defensive stats are going to be kind of I, I think they're going to be kind of skewed by by the fact that um, he doesn't have that guy behind him to really challenge shots the way that uh, Robin Lopez did last year. Yeah, for sure. And one thing about Damian Lillard's defense that I've noticed, and I saw particularly in that uh, that game against the Wizards, he's been getting a lot better at when bigger guys switch on to him. He's getting better at holding his ground and not just holding his ground, but he, his timing on swiping the ball away on those dribbles with someone. So let's say a bigger guy has his back to the basket and Dame is just, you know, it's a mismatch and Dame's just trying to hold his own ground. Being able to actually not get bowled over and just that kind of swipe and the timing of that has gotten way, way better. And I think that those little things, I don't know if he's ever going to be the greatest lockdown defender. I mean, Damian Lillard is plenty athletic and plenty driven. So, I mean, it's not unreasonable to say that he could be a good defender someday, but he's not particularly super ultra quick on defense, at least not yet. I don't think it's all athleticism. I think part of it's timing, but he has gotten better at when he is holding his ground, just the timing of when do I kind of reach in and go for it? And when do I don't? And it's led to a couple of, a couple of, a uh, couple of steals that lead to fast breaks in the last couple of games. That's been good to see. Yeah, definitely. And and so, Michael, I would say, you know, to kind of succinctly answer the question, uh, does Damian Lillard have room for improvement? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we would absolutely like to see some of these elite guards maybe not blowing up the Blazers on such a consistent basis. That 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 would be great if they, you know, stopped them every now and then. Sure. But, you know, like we said, these are this is this is the golden age of point guards in the NBA. Every night you're pretty much running up against a guy who can drop 30 on you, uh, you know, or at least every other night. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's rough out there for a point guard, you know, trying to defend these guys. So uh, while there is room for improvement, I think Damian Lillard definitely deserves some credit for the improvement that he actually has shown uh, over the last couple of years. Yeah, for sure. I agree. And Michael, we appreciate the question. We move on to a different one. We're going to go in house for this one. Uh, we're going to go to Blazers Edge's own Eric Griffith, who's been a frequent podcast guest. And Eric, shout, we're thinking, out. shout out to Eric. We're thinking about you right now. Wish that you were <laughs> here. Pour one out for Eric. Um, so Eric Griffith asks, is the D-League assignment a death knell for Alexander's and Montero's time as a Blazer? Chris, what do you think? Oh, he addressed that one specifically to me? No, he didn't address it specifically to you. <laughs> but I'm asking you because I'm asking the questions. What do you think? I I I just so the news just came out not long before this podcast. It was yeah, it was just like a couple hours ago. Is getting tracked. So we we haven't had a ton of time to take it in and kind of look at, you know, all of the angles and and all the news that's going to come out about it. Um, you know, from from what I can gather, I would say no, and I think, I think I saw this kind of reaction from a few commenters. Uh, so I'd like to give them credit. Not sure what the names are, but I think I did see this out there that, you know, maybe the Blazers anticipated, you know, having 
more time to develop these kind of guys at the end of their bench this year. Maybe they figure they at this point in the year that they would be not in the playoff race. As it turns out, the Blazers are chasing down not only the eighth seed, but the seventh or the sixth or potentially even the fifth seed, depending on on how the dominoes fall here. So the Blazers are in the thick of a, a pretty crazy playoff race. Um, that that kind of indicates that guys like Montero and Alexander aren't going to be able to get that kind of the time that the team had anticipated, you know, to use to develop them. So I think now is probably the time in the season where they're, they, they decided, yeah, let's, we got 20 games left They're They're not, they've already practiced two thirds of the season with the team. They know Terry Stotts sets. They have some familiarity with, with their teammates on the Blazers. I think, you know, they're, they're ready to maybe be apart from the team a little bit and maybe get some run uh, in the D League and maybe you know get some minutes and see if if they can actually you know maybe come back a little bit improved. I don't know. I, I I can't I can't believe it'd be bad for them. No, I mean, and just to start, so the Blazers used to be affiliated with like a one to one relationship with the Idaho Stampede, and that is no longer the case, right? Right, right. So it's uh, I believe it's it's kind of. Uh, if you don't have an individual affiliate with the team the way that the Blazers did with the Idaho Stampede, and I think the year after uh, the Stampede, they had a you know uh, a multi affiliate. I'm not sure how you would view that, but there was like five or six teams, and I think they kind of even dissolved that affiliation to where they're they're more or less they have no affiliation to any D League team, and I think those teams um, are able to pick up slots um, on other teams that have affiliations. I I think that's how it works. So, you know, maybe this being this late in the season is, is that's just when this kind of thing, you know, logistically could work out as well. So, I mean, and one more question before I go into my hot take, going to bust out my oven mitts for this one. Um, (laughs) Do you happen to know, are there any restrictions on when a team can send a player down to the D league? Like the same way we have trade deadlines and whatnot. Is there like a D league, you know, like send a guy down deadline? I do not believe so. I mean, there may be a buffer in between, games they may they may have to sit out if they're if if they played the day before or whatever but i don't think there's any uh restrictions on the amount of time they can spend there or anything like that gotcha all right so here comes my hot take all right get ready turn the <laughs> oven up to like 575 which is not usually an oven setting that you'll find it that's unsafe actually that's i know it's like a you know it's a pizza in a stone oven hot take level here don't try this at home <laughs> don't try this at home i used to actually so i used to be an oven guy in corvallis at american dream pizza and those ovens were mighty hot and it, the flashing around the ovens is metal and one time like i was putting a pizza in and put my arm up too high and it, like hit the metal and just burned the crap out of my arm it wasn't very much fun Yo, I did Pizza Hut and Eugene for a number of years. So shout out to all the the pizza dudes out there like me and Brandon. Shout out to all the pizza dudes, all the delivery drivers, all of you working hard. And dudettes. Oh, for sure. So my hot take is this. I'm surprised that Connaughton, Montero, and uh, Alexander haven't been sent down earlier. It's the Blazers. And I mean, you're right. I think part of it is the Blazers did not anticipate their season was going to go the way that it's gone. And it's been a lot of fun to watch. And they thought that they would get more development out of these players at the end of the bench because they didn't think they were going to be as good as they are right now in the playoff hunt. And maybe part of it, too, they didn't realize the West was going to be comparatively as weak as it's been in a number of years. But. I am surprised they haven't gone down sooner, and it, it makes sense. I mean, I just did a quick story for SB Nation's NBA Rookie Week, um, mostly focused on Montero, but also hit on Alexander and Connaughton. I mean, they've played, you know, several dozen minutes, you know, all season. You know, they've they've made several dozen points, and over, you know, so far like a 65 game season, that's telling you they're not playing much at all. The Blazers haven't needed them, so I am surprised that they haven't sent them down to the D League sooner. I think it's a good idea. Well, I mean. It, Neil's shown that he would, you know, if you look at the 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 way that the affiliate uh, affiliation with the Stampede dissolved, and then the affiliation with with the multiple teams, you know, only worked out for one year. You, you could see that that the organization, the Blazers, value having, you know, even if you're not playing on the court with the team, and even if you're in street clothes, you're still traveling with the guys. You're still practicing with the guys. You're still watching tape with the the video coordinators. You're still, you know, having conversations with the coaches. You're still getting your shots up every day with the team and being around the guys and being fully immersed in the culture of the team. And I think, you know, kind of, you know, there's something to be said for that camaraderie as well. Even if you're not playing, um, you know, man one through fifteen, we've been talking that 
about that all year. This is one of those things. If if those guys had gone down, you know, in December, you know, who's to say that this, the chemistry would be the same with the team? I, I don't think it would be any great loss to have that, but you you can tell that the Blazers kind of value having guys in house, even if if they're not playing on the court. Yeah, and to that end, I mean, you have to imagine. Or, you know, maybe you don't assume this, but it, I think it begs the question. I wonder if the Blazers management, like, talked to Cliff Alexander and Luis Montero before they sent them down. Like, hey, like, you know, you guys aren't playing very much and we love having you on the team. But, like, would you like to go down and actually play basketball somewhere and get some run? And, like, you know, like, if I were – if I mean, do they get paid the same amount? Do their contracts get prorated because they go down to the D-League and you're shaking your head no? So they get paid the same amount. I mean – I don't know. Like if I were, oh, just... they have to travel on in buses and and stay in, and uh, I don't know about motel sixes, but you know what I mean. I, it's a, like the accommodations are, aren't as great, and and so it's not, it's 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 no cakewalk. I mean, compared to the NBA, what they're used to. No, but they get to play, right? I I, I feel like the burning inside of every basketball player is the desire to play, even if it's not. I mean, if you're going to get zero minutes every single night, and I see what you're saying too, like obviously it's it's the life of a of a D League player is not the life of an NBA player, even the 15th man on a roster, and I do understand that, but I just feel like I'll, I, I I don't know I would want to play. I I could see them, and they're probably going to come back up at some point. Like, do you think they're going to stay down there all season? Or I at this point, it's really difficult to say. But I mean, barring major injuries, I don't see. I mean, I think. I think they'll bring him back in probably three weeks would be my guess. If, if you know, the way that the Blazers have used the D-League in the past is any indication. And, and from my recollection, most of it was bringing guys back from injury slowly. I think McCollum maybe played a, a quick stint there. And only guys like Armand Johnson, I think, and Luke Babbitt really recently in the recent past have played much for the Blazers in the D-League. So organizationally, it's just not something they tend to really get behind that much so so if history is any any indication i would guess maybe five six games a couple weeks just let the guys you know get some run this season and then get them back with the team in time for the playoffs is is what i would guess didn't cj mccollum play a little bit in the d league his first year yeah and i think that was i i don't think that was a result of lack of playing time i think it was because he was coming back from that injury and they just wanted to to kind of ease him back into things Right, you are. I'm just saying, maybe Luis Montero is the next CJ McCollum. Well, Come he's on. he's the next something. <laughs> he's the next something. All right, and we're going to go to the next question here. Uh, thanks, Eric, as always. Next question comes from us from Twitter, uh, Twitter handle at Blazers526. Uh, do you think Dame can be an all-NBA player if the Blazers go to the playoffs? Kemba and the Hornets have been excellent this year. So it sounds like Blazers five two six is asking: Is Damian Lillard an NBA All NBA caliber player? Uh, seeing as the league is, as you said earlier, stocked full of really really good point guards, Damian Lillard All NBA? Yes or no? Well, that's. I mean, if Dame doesn't get All NBA, it's going to be through no fault of his own, right? I mean. It would be it would be just a numbers game at that point where there's just so many elite players at that particular position that <laughs> that it, that that it's just there's just not enough room to give everybody who quote unquote deserves a spot to really get one. There's only there's only three All NBA spots. Yeah, I mean, I I say yes. I say that he is. I mean, can I can I just can I just go down the list? Let the list yeah, with you please, real that quick. That would be great. Yeah, that'd be okay. Awesome. So let, this this is kind of a, a rough a rough list here of just point guards and right and all NBA is, is is they still do five positions, right? They still do five positions, so it's five positions for first team, five for second, five for third, so fifteen total. Uh, so so we're going Steph Curry, Russ Westbrook, Chris Paul, Kyle Lowry, uh, John Wall. Like those are your guys, I think, who are who are really up there in the same, I mean, who Lillard would be in the conversation with. So Steph Curry, Westbrook, Paul, Lowry, Lillard, Wall. How many of those guys have to go? Three of those guys? Yeah. So you're going to say Steph Curry is automatic, right? Yep. And now who do the next two slots go to? Who do you, who do you eliminate from that? 
I mean, if you're going off strictly team performance, I guess you have to drop off Wall, but he's a pretty darn good player. Yeah, Wall's good. Uh, I think that you have to drop him, though, for the reason you just said. Raptors are doing better than the Wizards this year, and I think that that goes into consideration. But, I mean, I think number two would be Westbrook. Love him or hate him. He's a great player. Do you, I mean, do you think... Because Kevin Durant is going to get All-NBA small forward. Yes. Uh, so, do you think maybe you should give a nod to a guy like Lillard because he's playing with less talent? Do you think the voters look at it that way? They might. I mean, it's it's all subjective. And I guess some voters are going to say, look at, look at the supporting cast that Damian Lillard took to the Western Conference uh, playoffs. Uh, that's going to speak highly of him. Look at his post-All-Star break stats. Uh, I think every guy on this list that we're talking about is is an All-Star. So if if the guys if the people who are are voting for all NBA team are are looking at things like all star accolades, Damian Lillard's going to be on the outside on that one. Uh, if we're talking about team performance, Damian Lillard's going to be on the bottom half of that one. To me, there's only two spots up for grabs. I I think Lillard deserves it. But I'm not going to be surprised if he doesn't get it. And I'm not going to be upset. And I won't feel like he got snubbed if he doesn't make uh, any of the All-NBA teams this year. I think he definitely does make the team. I mean, there are a couple things going on. He's a top five scorer in the league. That's impressive. He's top 10 in assists. And also, I think it's easier to evaluate someone's talent. You get, You can never evaluate someone in a vacuum. You can never quantify someone's impact on the rest of the team and how they make people better. But I think that if you take a team like a Blazers that had an identity, had clearly, you know, a number one player in LaMarcus Aldridge and a system that was set up around him, take away that player, take away that system. And now you have Damian Lillard, not in a vacuum, but more or le- as close to an NBA talent vacuum as you can get. I mean, the Blazers were predicted to be in the high 20s and wins to be worse than the Lakers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what he's done with his team is pretty remarkable. I mean, the West is weaker than it has been, but if the, and I, this is going back directly to Blazers five, two, sixes question. I think that if the Blazers make the playoffs, that it will definitely help his all NBA chances. I think the fact that he's top five in scoring speaks volumes. I, I even feel like that his advertising presence, I mean, I don't want to be one of those people that says that players need to have a media presence and a commercial presence in order to be successful in the league. I don't think that that's true, but I do think that that plays a difference. If you're talking about, all-star voting obviously didn't work out for him this year and things like NBA all NBA voting. Some of it does come down to recognition and part of recognition is playing well, having big moments, which he's had and having a media presence. I think that all of that does play a factor. And I think his chances of getting all NBA this year are quite good. Yeah. So we, we talked about this earlier on about Dame and his reputation defensively and how the reputation hasn't necessarily caught up to his actual performance on the floor. So do you think Dame's reputation as a poor defender could hurt him? I mean, if you're looking at this list, the only other guy you can make a case uh, for for struggling as much on the defensive end of the floor is Russell Westbrook, really, right? Yeah, I mean, it's that's that's yeah, so far, yes. I mean, Steph Curry, I think he's as good or better. Uh, Chris Paul, definitely better. Kyle Lowry, definitely better. John Wall, definitely better. I mean, so it, it... Russ Westbrook is the only guy you could say would would be you could argue would be the worst of that group defensively and you might even say that I wouldn't necessarily say this that Russell Westbrook's uh, aggressiveness on the defensive end and his ability to create gamble and create turnovers occasionally for his team is, is as use as or more useful than what Damian brings uh to the defensive end of the floor for the Blazers. Uh I mean so I'm not saying he's definitely the worst of that bunch, but if 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 reputation is going to play a part in this, I would have to think that that the reputation is going to hurt Dame at least on the defensive end of the floor. I think that there is some truth to that. I think you bring up some pretty good points. I also think that you're dead wrong, and here's why. <laughs> I think that Damian Lillard's reputation has never been better across the league. His name recognition has never been higher. People have yeah, but defensively, nationally, they. He's not taken seriously as a good defender nationally. I don't think he's taken seriously as a good defender nationally. I agree with you there. What I do think is the overall conversation of who is Damian Lillard, that's positive. I don't think that you can just say, 
oh, he's not as good at defense as these other players and he's only marginally better at offense. Ergo, he doesn't make all NBA or ergo people don't have a positive view of him. I think that the, the, the shine of Damian Lillard, it's shining quite brightly right now. I, I mean, it's hard to disagree with that, but I think the people who vote for this, you kind of have to give them a bit of credit here. I, I think they're going to be able to look at this from all angles. And I, I, I imagine they're not just going to be impressed by top five scoring and top 10 assists. I think they're going to take into account both ends of the floor. I mean, and, and the impact that it has on the, on their teams. Yeah. I think that, I think that's also fair, but I don't think that neither do I think that they're only going to be looking at top five scoring top 10 assists. I think they're going to be looking at a team that has overachieved because of Damian Lillard. I think they're going to be looking at a team that's succeeding because of him. Obviously there's a lot, of other things that are going right for the Blazers right now, besides Damian Lillard, including a man named Mason Plumley, who is the subject of our next (laughs) question from Twitter from Oz to PDX shout out to Australia and to believe the hype. One of the better podcasts from Australia. Good eye, mate. Good eye, mate. Oz to PDX asks, is Mason Plumley's removal from the starting five inevitable in the off season, or could he hold on to that spot long-term? Okay, I this one, there's so much that goes into this. It's hard to know where to start, but I think a lot of this is going to have to do with Myers Leonard, um, what happens with him this summer. And I'm not implying that Myers Leonard would be taking over the starting position necessarily from Mason Plumley. But what I am saying is if, if he leaves, that's going to leave a spot for the Blazers probably to look for another big in their rotation, I would imagine. Uh, And they would pursue that via trade or free agency, or if they are able to acquire a pick sometime between now and the draft. I mean, so there's, we talked about Myers Leonard on the podcast last week. It sounds, there was kind of a consensus that none of us really thought that he would be back. uh, If he got a solid offer, I, I personally assume that uh, some other team is going to take a chance on him. So that said, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the Blazers don't match. Therefore, bringing in another big to the rotation. And that that's, I think the Blazers are really going to put a premium more so on rim protection on the defensive end um, than stretching the floor. That's that's just my guess. I mean, uh, you have Al Farouk Aminu, uh, who can play a little bit of stretch four. You have Mo Harkless, who's been pretty solid in the stretch four position for the Blazers this year. Uh, you know, you never know what's going to happen in free agency. There may be another guy who can, you know, fill that stretch four position. So, you know, I, I think that rim protection is going to be high on the Blazers list this summer. I think Mason Plumley is a great player. I think his passing is absolutely superb for his size and, and his the position that he plays. Uh, but I think this summer, the Blazers are going to be looking for an impact rim protector, at least a guy who can fill that role in that end. And I wouldn't be surprised if he were to take the starting job. Yeah, no, me neither. I mean, and I have to say, Mason Plumley brings more to that starting five spot than his statistics, I think, reflect. What And, and I mean, it's something that Dane Carbaugh, who is a guest on the Blazers Edge Weekend podcast last week, brought up. We talked a little bit about Mason Plumley's passing. I think that in Terry Stott's offense, that that is extraordinarily useful. I, and again, I think that it does the value of that, the value of Mason Plumley being able to, you know, be 6'11", I'd say solid 6'11", take up space, not the best defender, not the world's best rebounder, but he plays fairly smart. And his facilitation on offense, I think it's it's... Suffice to say that Mason Plumley's passing helps the Blazers' offense in ways beyond what the stats reflect, in my opinion. I don't know if you agree or disagree. Uh, so so let me ask you this what what makes what what's a good role player in the NBA right is it is it a guy who can do a little bit of everything at a decent level and do a, a couple of things relatively well maybe but also a good role player could be a a guy who does a few things really well and just has a somewhat limited skill set to me I'm looking at Mason Plumlee. I'm looking at his incredible ability to pass on the offensive end of the floor. I'm I'm looking at his ability to finish at the rim. He can't stretch the floor. You know, his athleticism is great, but he doesn't really do a heck of a lot else for the Blazers on the offensive end of the floor other than, you know, score at the rim and facilitate for teammates. So that, that does work great in the offense. But to me, that 
that indicates, you know, kind of a good role player and, and look at him on the defensive end of the floor. I mean, as athleticism is solid and he's able to do a lot of things and help out. But I think, I think his ceiling is kind of as, as one of those more limited skill set, solid role players. And, and while there's room for, you know, 20, 25 minutes for him and, and Terry Stotts is, uh, you know, uh, starting for Terry, uh, playing for Terry Stotts. Sure. But does it necessarily come off the bench or as a starter? Wouldn't be surprised to see him be the first big off the bench next year. Yeah, I could definitely see that. And all of this has to do with the moves the Blazers pl- the moves the Blazers make in the offseason. Because if they get, if it depends on how they want to shape their team. If they get players who are highly skilled offensively, Mason Plumlee's role will be one thing. If they get players that are super skilled defensively, his role will be another. And so it really depends on who you bring in after Mason Plumlee, I mean, if the Blazers are thinking that this team is going to be the team they're riding with for, you know, more than just the end of this year, I should say if fans are thinking that this is the team the Blazers will be riding with, they would be mistaken. Obviously, it's going to look different come training camp next year. Do you think Neil O'Shea takes a run at the coveted Roy Hibbert this summer? You know how glad I am to see that his season hasn't gone all that well because that was the kind of thing that I was worried was going to happen when the Blazers were pursuing him a couple of years ago that I don't know. I've never really liked Roy Hibbert to be honest. And I don't, I don't think that you can blame his drop in production just on the Lakers system. He was already showing signs of that when he was in Indiana. So let me, let me drop a couple of names. I personally, I think Hibbert is interesting at the right price. We'll see, you know, uh, what, what the market dictates. Come on, I mean that's that's Neil O'Shea's calling card is picking up guys off the scrap heap, guys who have been thrown to the side by their past team, guys who have quote unquote underperformed for their past team, and and basically having Terry Stotts and his offense and and the Blazers organization turn them into serviceable players. I mean we've seen that time and time over the years, right? I mean this is not a guy who is really you know who's been frozen out of his situation in his former team and is really looking to redeem himself. This is not someone who's young and hungry and unproven. This is someone whose best years are behind him at this point. And I am not convinced is particularly motivated to come into a city like Portland and work as hard as he has to work to be relevant. He was That's, motivated enough to sign a contract with Portland 3 summers ago. Yeah, I mean that was a lot of money. And that was in his prime. That was yeah. That was a lot of money and he would have been great back then for, I mean, history says he would have been great for two years and we'd be stuck with him, you know, the way he is now, which isn't so great. So I, well, he also went to the Lakers. I mean, he did start to drop off. He had some crazy issues, not necessarily, you know, with, with his on-court performance. I mean, things just weren't working out for him at all. You know, in the, I think it was the 2014 playoffs, with the Pacers, uh, yeah, that there, was hard to watch. There was that game he had zero re- or zero statistics whatsoever, and like twenty something minutes, not a rebound, not not even a shot attempt, nothing. Uh, I mean, so he fell off in the in the twenty fourteen playoffs. I'm not gonna lie. And then, you know, spending this past season with the Los Angeles Lakers. I mean, come on, what 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 is what is that gonna indicate? I mean, P- playing for think, Byron Scott. I mean, you went. I was just gonna say that if you go play for the legendary Byron Scott, you know, you figure you get a little more than we've seen from Roy Hibbert. No, it's not a great situation. I would not be interested in Roy Hibbert. Someone I would be interested in is someone who is not currently in the NBA, who used to play in the NBA, who may be open to coming back into the NBA, who is a little younger, who does have a little bit to prove. And his name is Larry Sanders. Okay. Well, let's throw him on top of the list because I want to drop a few more names uh, up here for we're talking about free agent centers this summer. Okay. Uh, Hassan Whiteside, unrestricted. Joe Kim Noah, unrestricted. Nah. Uh, Zaza, maybe a little too old, unrestricted. Festus, restricted. Uh, Hibbert, unrestricted. Jan Mihimi, unrestricted. Mozgov, unrestricted. Uh, Mote Yudis, restricted. Uh, Biombo, he's got a player option, but he could opt out of that. Uh, and then after that, Tyler Zeller restricted, and then it's kind of blah after that. I mean, so Roy Hibbert isn't the top of that list. Larry Sanders, to me, yeah, I like the dude, but there's I've seen no indication that, that he's preparing an immediate comeback. It just sounds like he said once he's kind of got his head clear, he's ready to come back. Is, is there any update on when he wants to come back? Because I, I don't think I've heard it. 
No, I mean, I don't think there's any update, but I mean, I, I want to go back to something that Blazer's Edge managing, managing editor Dave Deckard said in a podcast, one of his first podcasts with Phil Nasons on the Blazer's Edge midweek podcast a while back about Larry Sanders and the Blazers could could absorb someone like that, someone who needs a community, needs a strong kind of team ethic. Blazers have a leader in Damian Lillard and, you know, kind of a co-leader in CJ McCollum. Obviously, the team is close knit. They like each other. They like being around each other. And I feel like Portland would be a good environment for a player like Larry Sanders, who is coming back from not having been in the league for a while. Obviously, stress had something to do with that. Um, and again, I think that having a strong kind of team ethic uh, from top to bottom would be a good place for Larry Sanders. So in that respect, I think it would work out. But Chris, you mentioned uh, Monte Yunus. We actually got a question from Jonah W on Facebook. Uh, and he asks, should the Blazers offer Monte Yunus a big paycheck to stick it to the Houston Rockets <laughs> like the Blazers did with Cantor in his contract with the Oklahoma City Thunder? Should the Blazers throw a poison pill contract at Monte Yunus? Could that is that even something they could do considering his injury history? Uh, okay, so his injury history, I can't really speak to. I haven't watched a ton of Rockets games, but I do know... Uh, and just for the he, listeners who don't know, his trade to Detroit was voided on the premise that he failed a physical. So Houston shipped him out to Detroit. Detroit said that he failed a physical and they canceled the trade. So there's, a, there's a little bit of back and forth on that one saying that Detroit got cold feet. Uh, you know, hey, who knows on this one? But it definitely is something you have to consider. He's only played uh, a third of the games this season. Uh, he missed 11 games last year. He missed 20 games the year prior. Uh, his rookie year, he barely got into half the games. I'm not sure if that was due to injury or just because he was a rookie on the end of a talented bench. Uh, at any rate, he does have a tendency to not play full seasons. I mean, he hasn't in, in four in four seasons in the NBA, the most he's played is 71 games, right? So I think that's something you definitely have to consider. Um, joining a rotation like the Blazers, I would have to imagine that this would be if Myers Leonard uh, you know, were to to go elsewhere this summer and they were looking for a seven foot floor stretching option. Now, here's my problem with Monte Yunus. From that, from that end, he's a 31.5% three-point shooter. So if you're acquiring a guy to be, to be your stretch, designated stretch seven-footer on the team, if you're shooting 31%, I don't think that's really going to get the job done. Does he do it on the other end of the floor? Not really. I mean, so what does Mata Yunus truly bring to the table for a team? I mean, last year he averaged 12 points a game, got about six rebounds. That was about 29 minutes a game. I mean, that's that's solid stats. And he shot relatively well from the field and he had his best year shooting from three. Um, and, you know, we've seen this with a number of guys coming into Terry Stott's system, Gerald Henderson, al Farouk Aminu, uh, Mo Harkless, I believe, you know, all improving uh, under his offensive system from behind a three-point line. So I'm not saying it could never happen. But if we're talking about a max contract offer, that's not something that you are going to be taking a gamble on. On a 26-year-old guy with that kind of in, uh, injury history who's not necessarily proven as an outside shooter who would be designated to do that. I mean, what else does he bring to the floor that, that's worth a max contract? And I'm saying, I'm saying this because, yeah, I think it would be great to put an albatross contract around Daryl Morey's neck and weigh him down with a huge ma make force him to ma match a maximum offer to Mona Yudis. That would be, I think a lot of Blazer fans would be really interested in seeing something like that happen, right? But we know that Daryl Morey is, is a relatively shrewd GM, right? So he may not match that kind of an offer to Mona Yudis. And then you're Neil O'Shea and you have Mona Yudis locked up for four years for 17 million a year. I I don't think if we're doing a cost benefit analysis of this, I don't think potentially strapping Houston with an unreasonable contract going forward, I don't think that potential outweighs uh, the possibility that you could be the one uh, actually saddled with that terrible contract. I would love to see the calculus that goes into a team that would do something like that a poison pill contract that was not a max contract. 
I just love to see the guys running the calculators, the Mac man. Hmm, I wonder how many millions of dollars per year we can offer this guy to the point where they're going to have the, their team with restricted free agent rights match it. But yeah, I mean, the only thing that you look at there is that he is 25. I mean, there have been even big men in the league throughout the years who, you know, have had injury problems here and there and have come back and had relatively productive careers. I mean, if you have a little bit of time, you want to Google uh, Zadrunas Ilgauskas' stats. I mean, he missed large, large parts of multiple seasons with recurring foot injuries. And when you're over seven feet tall, I think, you know, most of us who know basketball know that foot injuries are the one thing that you don't want to see when you're that huge. And you know, lo and behold, he had all the bones in his foot fused together or whatever. They put some super glue in there and he was, he was good to go <laughs> for like five more years. I mean, he was, so, I mean, and I don't think that you see anything chronic with Monte Yunus. I mean, you could always say, and I said this last week about Myers Leonard, that you could, you could always say that what would be great for a guy who's kind of like in his mid twenties in the NBA trying to find his way and hasn't really stuck yet, you know, a change of scenery. And so that could be part of the appeal. Like, well, only if he were in our system, think about what we could do and how much more confidence we could give him. So I think that's part of the appeal too. So a Mac contract, probably not, but I, again, I would be very interested to see the calculus that goes into, okay, just how much could we offer this guy to the point where Houston would feel compelled to match? I, whatever. Okay. Whatever that number is, offer that to Myers Leonard. Cause I'll take Myers Leonard right now over Mona Yunus. You take Myers over Mona Yunus. Is that, is that crazy to say? No, I don't think it's crazy to say. What's your, what's your reasoning for it? I just think Myers Leonard is, well, he's three years younger. I think that's kind of important. I think that he's proven at the NBA le- level that he's a capable three-point shooter. So as soon as he gets his head straight, barring that actually happening. I just uh, want I, I to, I need to fact check dot org you right here. Myers Leonard is only one year younger than Monty Yunus. That's Is he 24 now? Yeah. Okay, we'll scratch that from the record, but he just had his twenty fourth birthday. Happy birthday, Myers Leonard. I know he's a big fan of the podcast. All right, I'm gonna be pedantic and say he's still younger than Mona Yunus, so the point still stands. By one year. <laughs> at any rate. Uh but I think that Myers Leonard has already proven at the NBA level that he's a capable three point shooter. He just has to get you know some I I we've speculated this ad nauseum on the podcast and elsewhere, maybe get some mental things in order. I think he doesn't have the injury history, Amoni Udis. I think he's got more potential on the defensive end. Uh, if he can keep his eyes open at all times and, and continue get back to the verticality that was kind of rubbing off on him from Joel Freeland and Robin Lopez last year. If he can kind of get back some of that, some of his confidence, if the Blazers can get him, if, if it comes down to 10 million, for him or 12 million for Mona Yunus. Cause I imagine that's, that's a realistic number to say $10 million on Myers Leonard. I, I'm taking that every day of the week. Fair enough. I, I mean, I think that that's, I don't think that's crazy at all. I think that's a completely logical argument to make. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be completely sorry here. I'm going to be completely honest. I don't, this is going to be a huge surprise to everyone. I don't watch a ton of Rockets games and Mona Yunus, when the Rockets do play, Mona Yunus is a lot of times in street clothes. So I haven't gotten a ton of opportunity other than when he plays the Blazers uh, and when they play on national games to really see him in his full context with the team. So it's it, it's impossible to say for me definitively. I'd, I'd want to look into it a little more, but definitely I think right now with what I know, I'm, I'm taking Myers Leonard. Sorry, sorry to add that qualifier. No, I think it's I think that's fair. So moving on to a different question. This is also from Twitter. Uh from Twitter handle might be Canadian. He <laughs> might be. We're not we're not sure. No one's sure. Uh might be Canadian asks, what do you make of the dip in Alan Crabb's offense the last couple of months? And I didn't go back a couple months, but I will say the eye test says he's had a bit of a slump uh looking at the stats here over the last 12 games. Allen, cool breeze, crab has averaged, but six points, a couple of boards, a couple assists. His shooting percentage is down around 37%. Chris, I know that Allen Crab is your all time favorite blazer of 2015 16 season. <laughs> uh, Allen Crab, is he in a slump? Is he going to break out of it? What's going on? I mean, come on. The guy is in his first season of actually playing legitimate minutes. So CJ McCollum. That's fair to say. 
that is fair to say, but I I don't think anybody would would suggest that Alan Crabb is a more talented player or even as talented necessarily as CJ McCollum. Being a first year guy, getting your first real minutes, being a part of a rotation, being a role player, coming off the bench. I mean, he came out of the gates very strong. No one's no one's going to disagree with that. It surprised everybody. I mean, so yeah, th- this is what's going to happen with a young guy who's not used to a ton of minutes becoming, you know, a legitimate part of a rotation. I mean, I know that in college he was, I, I believe he was Pac-12 Player of the Year. Uh, I think his sophomore, junior season. I mean, so he's used to the big stage, but the NBA is a whole different level, right? And coming off the bench in Terry Stott's system, getting the amount of shots that he has this year, that's that's a huge uptick you know, considering where he came from. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not surprised this happens. And you know what? Like now that he's more or less on opponents scouting reports when, when they're about to play the Blazers, yeah, they're going to know a little bit more about what they can kind of, you know, throw out the Blazers bench to kind of slow them down a little bit. And I think it's kind of natural. I mean, Gerald Henderson started the season out slow. He's progressed to become a really important key uh, to the Blazers bench. Alan Crabb started out really important and he's going through a slump right now. I mean, this this happens with Blazers. There's ebbs and flows to every player season. I don't mean to be a huge apologist for Alan Crabb, but I, I guess I'm not sorry. Cool Breeze is the best. So whatever. I, I, I have faith in him. I think he'll bounce back by the playoffs. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. And we just got done talking about how well he's been doing over the last 12 games. But if you look at an, the entire season, uh, 64 game sample size. I mean, he's still averaging double digit points per game off the bench, which is pretty impressive. He's still shooting above 46% and he's taking three and a half threes a game. And, you know, I agree with you. Part of it is because he's young. It's the first time he's been in the starting lineup. And, you know, I have faith that he's going to bounce back before the end of the season as well. Um, and Chris, we're going to get to this one more question here. And again, thank all of you for sending him in uh, every week. Even if we don't solicit questions, feel free to Hit either me or Chris up anytime. We'd love to hear from you. Um, This question coming from Brian via email. Um, Brian says, I've seen some Blazers discussions mentioning, quote, the glue guy. I like that idea a lot. How important do you think it is to have that glue guy? And who do you think would make your top five all-time Portland Trailblazers glue guy list? Yes. So this, this this is probably one of my favorite kind of questions because it's, it's so subjective. It's perfectly right? objective. I think that there are <laughs> metric. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah. I think when you look at it, you, you can't even, you can't even get two different people to pretty much agree on what, what it is that a glue guy does. I mean, for the most part, I think you can kind of come up with, with what it generally means to everybody. But it, this is such a cool question because this could mean something different to, to different players. I mean, to different people answering the question. And really, you know, some guys, to me, I'm I'm looking at like wings. For some reason to me, it seems like shooting guards and small forwards like tend to be the glue guys. And I think that's because they, they tend to be able to get the kind of guys who have more of a varied skill set. You know, they can kind of do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, whereas a point guard is a little bit more geared in a certain direction and a big man's geared a certain way. So I think it's maybe the versatility of of the kind of the wing position that kind of, you know, lends itself to being, you know, where where we kind of define glue guys generally playing. And so so that said, I guess I want to preface this by saying both Brandon and I are dirty millennials, so our my list is is going to be heavily skewed, you know, t- towards guys probably towards the late '90s and the 2000s. I know there were a ton of glue guys uh, from the '70s, '80s, and the early '90s that I'm just not as familiar with as a lot of the older fans. So, uh, if you want to let us know in the comments where we missed out, that'd be awesome. You know, I, I guess Maurice Lucas is a guy who's not a small forward, but Definitely, I think a lot of guys would call him a glue guy. So you might, you might, he he'd probably make a lot of people's lists. I'm gonna say I'm gonna start out with with uh, Plastic Man, Stacy Ogman. Nice from those from those early 2000s teams, uh, and I, and this is in no particular order, right? And I may not even get to five. I'm just gonna name as many as I can. I'm gonna say Stacy Ogman though, because the guy was a maestro on the defensive end. 
a solid player on the offensive end. I think, you know, a bit, I believe he had a bit of a three point shot, right? You know, so kind of one of those three and D guys before it was in vogue. I mean, he could come off the bench and give you some energy. He was a good finisher. I mean, he really, he helped the team in a lot of ways with his energy. Uh, definitely like him as a glue guy. Um, I think you could probably say that this one might, this one might not be the most popular opinion. I think Nick Batum definitely for, for my, for as long as I've been viewing the team has to be up there. The glue guys, and I'm going to throw Wesley Matthews in there too. I mean, I think Wes, Wesley Matthews is the glue guy in the sense that everybody has got his back and vice versa. I mean, he has the respect of all of his teammates. Uh, he respects all his teammates. It, it just seemed to be that he was kind of the emotional leader for the Blazers when he was with them. I think that's one aspect of being a glue guy. Nick Batum, on the other hand, was kind of you know the the Swiss Army knife could do a little bit of everything. His facilitating from the small forward position, I think, really really helped him kind of get get kind of a blue uh, glue guy uh, label of if that's kind of what what you think about him. Yeah, I definitely agree with Nick Batum. Perfect example of a glue guy. I mean, part of being a glue guy in my mind is that you're not a star, that you kind of do stay out of the way in some respects. Basically, I mean, you could almost call it like a, like a lubricant guy, right? You're the guy that allows the rest of the team to function more smoothly. That's what I think of when I think of a glue guy. So Nick Batum definitely fits that mold. And it's funny that you say Wesley Matthews because I almost feel like Wesley Matthews is too much of an emotional leader to be a glue guy. I almost feel like to be a glue guy, you can't be the one who's either out in front, which Wesley Matthews wasn't necessarily out in front, but you also, I don't think can be the one cranking up the emotional temperature of the team. I think that that puts you into a different category of player. Maybe that's being just a little ridiculous, but I would almost argue that Wesley Matthews had too much fire to be a glue guy. What do you think about that? I mean, you could make that case, but I think, it, look, look at why do you call it glue guy? Because it holds everything together, right? Wesley Matthews, come on, look at what happened when he went down. Yeah, I mean, that was, and I, you know, it's funny because I, when we talked about that, I think it was, it was either last week or the week before. I was thinking about Wesley Matthews was an incredible defender, but so much of what the Bla- what made the Blazers a great defensive team wasn't his individual defensive prowess as acute as it may have been, it was how he fit with the rest of the team. So in that respect, yes, very much a glue guy. So here's a, here's another one from a little bit, a little bit earlier on. And I, I'm just, I'm spitballing. I don't know what you think about this. Cliff Robinson, dude. Yes. Uncle Cliffy and Jerome Kersey, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Both Jerome Kersey and Cliff Robinson. Again, guys who knew what their roles were. I mean, Cliff Robinson, Drone Kersey was a little bit more typecast. You knew exactly what he was going to do, what position he played, and what he was going to offer. Cliff Robinson was more of that kind of Nicola Batum, Swiss Army knife type player. You know, obviously was a stretch for 6'11", could play, you know, light center and then some power forward, some small forward is I think mostly where he was hanging out. Uh, but even before you had those stretch fours, you had Cliff Robinson um definitely think that he's a glue guy i'm trying to think now through the 2000s it's into the scotty pippen too much of a, a a star player to be a glue guy i mean he did he did a ton of facilitating from the point forward position well and also that i feel like that iteration of blazers was not like quote unquote team enough to have a glue guy it always felt to me like an amalgamation just Sabus. like yeah, yeah. Let's say I could definitely see that. I could see that more than Scotty Pippen, to be honest. Uh, you know, let's see. Is there is there anybody we're leaving out? Uh, what about Brian Grant? I mean, he doesn't play oh, yeah. the the general glue guy position, but if we're talking about emotional leader in that sense and helping hold things together, I mean, come on, right? I definitely would go for Brian Grant. I mean, it was so much fun watching him play defense against Shaquille O'Neal, a human being who is, you know, it's almost like someone took, you know, the outline of a person and hit like scale by one and a half times. And you (laughs) go from how big Brian Grant was to how big Shaquille O'Neal was. Grant guarding O'Neal on the post is one of my favorite things to watch because of how much he put into it. He didn't give up any ground. And I know a lot has been made of, you know, Brian Grant's effectiveness was diminished somewhat 
when they changed the rules in the NBA, and I remember this too when I was, you know, a little kid. The way I used to box out was I would, you know, get my position, just start kind of like, you know, going backwards, like really pushing into yeah. the guy. That's something right Grant. Thing up. Yeah, he would just yeah, exactly. Back up, get the center of gravity real low, get right into Shaq's knees. And when they when they changed that rule, when they made it to more of you kind of had to just pick your spot on the floor and hold your ground. That did diminish Brian Grant's effectiveness somewhat. Um I would definitely say he was a glue guy for sure. I mean, and I mean, let's fast forward a bit, stay in the power forward position, come to modern times, easy Ed Davis. Yeah, I think you could make, I think, well, I mean, see, that's, you could make the case. And because, because this is, this is such a subjective argument, I think, I think it's reasonable to throw that out there. Um, I, Man, because he does all the dirty work, and he gets he gets the rebounds, uh, and does all the putbacks, and works hard on the defensive end of the floor. You know, in terms of of you know really holding the team together, I mean, he sets the tone a lot with his hustle and his energy. I would say that he does hold the team together. I mean, of course. Now, part of this is that Ed Davis has been with the team for less than a full season, but part of what I and a lot of Blazers fans really appreciate about him is how many possessions he saves. So it's not that just he's a great rebounder. He's a great offensive rebounder. Every time Ed Davis, you know, taps it into the backcourt for Lillard and McCollum to get it. Every time he battles three different people to get just the right position, jump just the right time to save the possession. It's so unbelievably useful for the rest of the team. I think that's the definition of a glue guy. He is literally the reason why the Blazers are going to get another shot. And, dollars to donuts the shot is not going to come from him right i mean this is the opposite of a guy who gets the rebound and tries to go straight back up when there are like five other guys you know draped over his back um i don't know I, to me that's a definition of a glue guy what about what about john crotty john crotty i haven't <laughs> you know i haven't thought about john crotty <laughs> in a while um what about um, what, what about steve blake i mean i <laughs> Just messing around about John Crotty. I want to be clear on that one. Uh, Steve, Blake, I think you're being dead serious. And you're just trying to cover it up. Steve Blake, uh, I, he's a facilitator, not a glue guy. But yeah, I can, uh, yeah. I'll throw out Ime Udoka for 06, 07, uh, starting, I think, 70 some games uh, for the Blazers at small forward that year. Brandon Roy's uh, rookie year. Uh, Lamarcus's rookie season with the Blazers, I think. Ime kind of filled that glue guy role for them i mean and and it was a really good story i mean i've said i've said a ton of times on the podcast how much i really liked him not just on the court but as a person and that kind of is what goes into a glue guy i mean it has to be generally you would think a likable guy or a guy who at least has infectious energy uh and and skills like that and and i think he may kind of fits that role yeah for sure and i i will be honest with you that was the kind of the low point of my Blazers fandom. I know Chris, you've told stories many a time about how you were out making deliveries, listening Woo. to the, to the Blazers on the radio in the, in the, in the back room and through the, all those dark years. And we all owe you a debt of gratitude <laughs> for that because someone needs to keep the support of the team going, even when they're not doing so well. I, I wasn't the only one. There were dozens of us. Yeah, there were absolutely <laughs> dozens and dozens of you. And Chris, I feel like we've gotten to the end of our question. So uh, you want to wrap it up? Do you have anything else for listeners? Yes, I do. I want to say uh, thank you to everybody who sent in questions this week. Uh, that was really awesome of you guys to do that on Twitter. Keep those coming there. You can also send them to Dave's mailbag, blazersub at gmail.com. You can uh, hit us up on Facebook. Uh, anyway, you want to get those in, we're... Um, more than willing to answer those anytime on the podcast so thank you for that also thank you to all the listeners who helped make blazers edge night um on march 28th against the kings a reality uh personally i'm really stoked to see that that's march 28th 2000 kids over 2033 kids i think is, is the final number and their chaperones are going to be going to that game uh based on the charity from listeners uh, and supporters from Blazers Edge. So we really appreciate that. Uh, if you want to hang out with any of us at the game, you can go ahead and hit up Brandon Goldner. He runs the uh, at Blazers Edge Twitter account. Uh, and we, we'd love to meet you guys if that's something you guys are interested in. Yeah, Blazers Edge Night is for sure one of the things that makes me really, really grateful to work here. Yeah, I, I love it. And every year, 
it's gotten bigger and bigger. So, heck, maybe next year they'll they'll allot us three thousand tickets. I mean, based on the generosity of the listeners and, and the readers in years past, I mean, this is something that can keep getting bigger and bigger. So, March twenty eighth against the Sacramento Kings Blazers Edge Night. Uh, be there or be square. Uh, Brandon, I I want to say you know thank you uh, to all the listeners. For, for joining the show. We don't often get to do mailbags, so thank you so much for listening to this show. Uh, the music for this week was provided uh, intro and outro by Odar. Uh, you can hear more of his work at soundcloud.com slash Odar Beats. Make sure you tune in to the Blazers Edge podcast early next week, where you can hear foundations of Dave Deckard. For Brandon Golder, I'm Chris Lucia. We'll be back with the Blazers Edge podcast next weekend.